<clears throat> so welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you who are uh, new or newer, uh, when Brian invited us to bow to the Buddha, uh, do not be mistaken and thinking you've wandered into a bunch of idol worshippers. Uh, uh, When we uh, bow to the Buddha, and a bow is just uh, respect, appreciation, just a symbol of respect, appreciation. Uh, in that moment, we come out of ourself. And we uh, acknowledge that we are not alone and that we are interconnected uh, with a great uh, vast web of uh, experience. In this case, uh, the experience uh, of this uh, lineage, tradition that's, that's called Buddhism, which is a name. Uh, but it's just a name for what? Uh, for people. <laughs> for people uh, that have, uh, going back to the uh, Buddha himself, who was a man, and all the uh, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of people uh, for 2,600 years who have uh, studied, practiced, and realized uh, the teachings of the Buddha. It is because of them uh, that we are here and that we are able to uh, connect and hopefully uh, be motivated uh, to uh, participate in this great river of uh, healing and transformation and awakening uh, that is really at the core, at the heart of what it really means to be a human being. Uh, we are often uh, in our lives caught up in the smallness of our own personal lives and dramas and uh, we lose perspective. So uh, in that moment uh, when we bow uh, and again, the Buddha is just a representation of all that. Uh, it is, uh, there is something in our heart uh, that opens as we remember that uh, there, we, are, we are not just ourselves, uh, but we are deeply interconnected uh, with so much. And the other uh, thing uh, that we uh, uh, bow to the Buddha, because a Buddha is simply uh, means awakened. And uh, each of us uh, have the capacity to awaken. Each of us has the seed of awakening within us. Uh, each of us has a Buddha nature, a true nature that has never been defiled or diminished in any way, uh, no matter how much nonsense we've been up to in this lifetime. And so uh, acknowledging that inherent purity of mind uh, that is right here, uh, and that can be mined uh, by each of us and all of us. Uh, that is another reason uh, we bow. I just wanted to add a little bit. Uh, so again, uh, you know that uh, over these past uh, months we have been looking at many things, but really focusing more recently on what's called in Buddhism uh, the seven factors of awakening. And for those of you who knew, what I have uh, been sharing is that, uh, that it is often in our own psychological, therapeutic, uh, self-improvement uh, uh, culture uh, that we are uh, primarily uh, told to focus on working through our issues working through our stuff. Uh, but as I've said before, uh, many of you have maybe come to the conclusion that that is endless. <laughs> Just when you think you've worked through one issue, another one pops up. Uh, and again, I am not uh, poo-pooing uh, uh, that kind of work. I'm saying uh, we, we need uh, to be primarily focused on cultivating health and well-being 
and if we cultivate health and well-being in our uh, bodies and our minds, many of the issues, uh, many of the emotional afflictions, uh, many of the things that hinder us uh, will naturally uh, diminish. Right. Uh, uh, learning to cultivate a healthy mind, which in this case we call an awakened mind, is no different than learning to cultivate a healthy body. Right. Uh, when we, uh, when we uh, move away from ill health, uh, when we move away from unconsciousness in terms of our bodies, and we see it as something that needs our care uh, in terms of uh, getting enough sleep and eating the right foods and exercise and, uh, and et cetera, uh, washing, cleaning, all that stuff, we realize uh, that that kind of care is even more important to our minds, for our minds, if we want a healthy mind. A healthy mind is a mind in Buddhism uh, that is free of afflictions, free of all negative emotionality. And that is a mind that it's at peace, it's at ease, it's at rest, and is uh, filled with uh, positive emotional experiences. Uh, again, so uh, in Buddhism, uh, we have these seven factors of awakening. Uh, such as mindfulness and concentration, uh, diligent effort, uh, investigation, uh, joy, uh, ease, uh, and equanimity. Uh, but what I talked about last week was uh, there is something uh, that is understood, uh, but for some reason is not formulated in those seven. And so I took time last week, and I'll take a little more time this week, to talk about uh, another primary factor of the awakened mind, uh, which is love, uh, which is love. Because uh, these other factors that I mentioned uh, are really about our minds. Uh, but since we do not exist uh, alone, since we exist with each other, uh, since we live in relationship, uh, it is the teachings on love uh, uh, that give us uh, a guideline to how to uh, cultivate uh, an awakened attitude uh, in life. Uh, and life, again, means all our relationships, including our relationship with ourself, uh, so to speak. So the teachings on love uh, are the teachings of non-self. Many people think that the teachings of non-self are teachings that are primarily uh, just in the meditative, uh, introspective tradition. Uh, but if one is uh, uh, letting go of uh, a self-centered and egocentric uh, way of living and viewing life, uh, and if one begins to come out of that and begin to notice uh, others and their situation, uh, the natural expression uh, of that would be, uh, in a positive way, these teachings on love. And as I said last week, there's actually in Buddhism no word for love. Uh, what is, what is uh, primarily taught in Buddhism in terms of uh, what we call love are, uh, these are often called the four immeasurables, uh, the four Brahma-viharas, the, the godly states, uh, uh, the states of mind that cannot be measured. Why can't they not be measured? Uh, because they are so wonderful and they are so boundless. Uh, many of us think uh, the attributes of what we might call love are something uh, only to be parceled out. Right. We kind of give it in little ways, very carefully. Uh, but the Buddhist teachings is no. Uh, these, uh, these, that love uh, is boundless. It is immeasurable. And it can be uh, the very basis of our minds uh, and, and how it acts uh, in the world. Uh, last week, uh, I focused on the first two, uh, loving-kindness, uh, 
and compassion. And again, please understand that even though uh, they are called the four immeasurables, and I'm talking about them in terms of the awakened mind, please understand uh, that all these qualities are known to all of us. They are capacities of our minds. The seeds of these things are already in us. Practice is learning how to cultivate them so they grow. Uh, the first one, again, metta, is uh, all the qualities of friendship. Right? So if we're driving down a one-way street and we see your car coming in the distance towards us, going the wrong way, uh, you know, uh, we might easily uh, be alarmed. But also, we would have very negative thoughts about that driver. And as they came closer, uh, we would have more negative thoughts. I won't say what they could be, uh, but they might be highly negative. When they get very close, and we've kind of pulled a little out of the way, and we look, and who do we see? Our best friend. Our best friend. Immediately what happens to all our ne aversive, hateful, negative, judgmental thoughts about that idiot? <laughs> all of a sudden we become what? Understanding. Wow, that's right. that's so and so. I wonder that's strange. I wonder how they are. I wonder what's happening. Hope they're okay. Can you see right away we shift from ourself and the way we look at the world with criticism and judgment and evaluation, and all of a sudden we see it from the other eyes and we see it with concern. With caring, you can see, and it's it's instantaneous, right? We don't have to think, oh, I'm supposed to be generating loving kindness. I shouldn't be doing this. You see, that's what we usually do. It's all like it's it's something we impose, but no, it's natural because we see a friend, we see somebody we care about, and immediately. Uh, it's a, it's a very different response. I mean, I could give other examples. Uh, you know, we can just continue. You know, road rage. And I and from my uh, talking to people, I realize that road rage is just the tip of the iceberg. That many people, uh, when they drive, uh, get pissed off at other people who drive. <laughs> and in the privacy of their own cars, uh, think and even say things uh, that are <laughs> they're quite rageful. Uh, not everyone here has moved on to the uh, cutting, you know, cutting people off and running them down and shooting them. Uh, but, the, uh, uh, but the seeds of road rage, uh, there may be many people in here uh, who can acknowledge they're in themselves already. Right? Again, just think about whoever just cut you off or pulled a bad move or is driving so slowly. If all of a sudden you saw they were your best friend, immediately again, your response to that situation would immediately, again, without having to reference the four measurables, uh, would immediately uh, change. Uh, again. So in Buddhism, we are taught that we need to retrain our minds so that we begin to be more inclusive. We be more inclusive in who we see as a friend, who we offer friendship to. Again, even people who do terrible things and there are people in this world who do terrible things. If they are our best friend, if they are our son and daughter, we will respond differently than if we see them as some uh, hateful creature outside the human pale. And that is the truth, isn't it? We all know that. Again, that shows there is this innate capacity human mind to offer friendship, and it is only limited by the way we limit it.
the way we parcel it out, the way we pick and choose, who, who gets it, who doesn't get it, who deserves it, who doesn't deserve it. And again, as I've said before, if we turn it around, uh, each of us thinks if there's anybody who deserves loving kindness and compassion, it's who? It's me, right? That's what we, I mean, we all think that, right? We all expect that. We all often get hurt or disappointed or angry or irritated uh, from, if other people don't give it to us. And yet, uh, when it's reversed, uh, we are often very different. So it's very important that uh, we look deeply uh, into uh, the capacity uh, that each of us has uh, to offer friendship on a wider and wider circle. What's a Buddha? Offers it to everyone. That's all. Sees everyone as friends. Everyone as family. Everyone has the potential to change. In the Buddha's own time, uh, there was a famous serial killer uh, who became uh, a disciple of the Buddhas and changed. Uh, for those of you who've seen uh, the documentaries uh, Dharma Brothers, I think it's quite well known about uh, uh, Vipassana a meditation course that was uh, done uh, in a maximum security prison in uh, Alabama, I believe. And, uh, you know, you, you, you see the capacity uh, for transformation as well as uh, just, uh, I think last month, uh, we, we showed it, another documentary about uh, uh, meditation uh, in prisons in, uh, in India. And again, seeing that capacity uh, for transformation uh, that is innate in every human being. Uh, the second, again, uh, which is sort of a, a step up from uh, uh, loving kindness, but a natural next step is compassion. And again, as I said last week, for those of you who weren't here, uh, compassion in Buddhism does not simply mean empathy, but it involves a, a, uh, a desire, a wish, uh, to free that being or beings or peoples uh, from their suffering. It is not just empathy. It's not just, I feel, I, I feel your pain. It's, I, I feel your pain. Uh, what can I do to re help relieve it? So it has a very strong active component. And again, uh, coming back to our first thing of metta of loving kindness, uh, karuna as it's called, uh, is a natural spontaneous step. Uh, people we love, people we care about, uh, friends, family, colleagues, uh, when they are suffering, again, without uh, uh, you know, thinking of the four measurables, hopefully uh, uh, the, you know, all of us have some uh, compassion, our first response is what? How can I help? What can I do? It's, it's natural. A natural aspect of our heart that is only again limited by the mind's, uh, by the mind's uh, conditioning. That over time uh, we have narrowed, we have constricted, we have constrained, we have limited our heart-mind. Uh, that it again only uh, parcels it out. Uh, we have become uh, more or less hard-hearted. And uh, some of us may think, oh, no, I'm, a, I'm not that way. And that's good if, that's, if you think that. But again, please check yourself and see, uh, is it limitless? Am I willing uh, to let go of my own self-centeredness and my ideas of who deserves it and who doesn't deserve it? Uh, it is said that the Buddha, the Bodhisattvas, uh, look at all beings as their children. Again, another uh, kind of metaphor. Why is that? Because if you're a parent, even if you have a rotten child, and there may be people here who have rotten children, they do, they do have that capacity. Uh, hopefully they grow out of it. Uh, uh, but even... <laughs> uh, 
again, parents have this wonderful capacity to what? To continue to love them. To continue to support them and to continue to try to find ways to bring them back to health. So it is important that as we look around our world, our personal world, our interpersonal world, our societal world, and the world world, uh, we approach the, 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 the people of the world and all the things they're up to uh, with that uh, spirit of loving kindness uh, and compassion. So let me spend some time uh, on talking about the next two. And again, uh, Buddhism does not have a word for love, which is interesting. Uh, it talks about uh, loving kindness, metta talks about uh, compassion, karuna, and it talks about these next two, uh, uh, mudita, which is, um, no, I mean maitri, which is, uh, no, medita, which is, uh, it's sort of translated taking joy in the joy of others, and the last one, upeda, which is uh, equanimity, equality. These four together might be called the teachings, the Buddhist teachings on love. Uh, but there's no word for love the way we have it. And obviously, uh, and I think I mentioned this before, uh, that uh, somebody might wonder, uh, because it's interesting, because in our culture, uh, love primarily refers to what? Romantic love. I mean, that's what we're obsessed with, romantic love. And that's really what the, I mean, even though people are, are often sold that they're supposed to love their Coke or their Pepsi or their car or, you know, I mean, love is, uh, love is, uh, is quietly, uh, widely used. Uh, it's often most internalized in people as, uh, you know, the, uh, the standard is uh, a romantic love. Again, uh, Buddhism traditionally has, uh, you know, nothing against romantic love other than uh, simply that romantic love tends not, tends not to facilitate a mind of ease, a mind of openness. Uh, romantic love tends to be fairly disturbing, uh, both on the upside and the downside. Uh, you know, the, when, when romantic love is going well and it is intoxicating again, it, it, it has a certain level of uh, emotional disturbance and obsession and, uh, well, I don't need to tell you, do I? <laughs> Uh, as well as uh, romantic love uh, has the capacity to turn into its opposite. As, as again, I don't need to tell you. So uh, for, for that sense, uh, romantic love is not, is not held up as an example of true love. Is that, is that clear? Uh, and actually, uh, probably I would say that, uh, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, what we consider romantic love uh, is fairly uh, immature. You know, and that if we are in a relationship that we want to be founded on love or have a loving relationship, it would really have these four qualities that I'm talking about. Uh, you know, even though, as we know in our culture, uh, since, uh, you know, we, we have given up arranged marriages, we, you know, that may uh, come back one day to be the cutting edge. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, since we have given up uh, uh, letting our, our, our parents and families, our official matchmakers uh, uh, oversee our relationships, uh, we have surrendered to what? Uh, to romantic love. And again, so that seems to be the attractor uh, these days. But again, uh, again, we all know that if, there's not, if that does not mature uh, into these four immeasurables, it is not a basis for a happy uh, relationship. So again, the first two, uh, friendship and compassion. Again, this willingness to understand another. That's what compassion is. You know, to get out of my own uh, self-concern and to be willing, uh, even when somebody's acting like a jerk, to under, want to understand to understand uh, that when they are acting like a jerk, they are it, 
Aha, uh -huh. they could be suffering. They could be suffering. How do we know they're suffering? They're not at ease. Hurt, angry people are not happy people, are they? That's a hint. <laughs> they may be suffering. And they may probably see me as the cause of their suffering. Again, if we are compassionate beings, uh, we don't uh, stop at that. We get out of our own way and we generate uh, this compassion. You know, this awareness of the other suffering and what can I do to help? What can I do, you know? I am sorry if my behavior uh, appeared to you as something like such and such and such and such. A lot of people go, oh no, no, that would be sort of uh, acknowledging that they're right. You know, because if one thing we like to be is what? Right. right. And we don't like to be wrong. Right. But again, to acknowledge the validity of someone's uh, 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 feelings, even if they're not, even if we think they're off base, is not saying they're right. It's just saying, oh, you know, I thought I was being uh, nice, right? Or I thought I was doing right here. Uh, but I can tell because you're totally pissed and uh, uh, that something, something's, uh, something's amiss, you know? Well, let me stop and what? And be interested and curious about what it is uh, that we perceive the same thing so differently. Is that, is that clear? That is compassion. That comes out of wanting the other person not to suffer and to do, you know, do whatever I can. So somebody, just in case somebody doesn't raise the issue, this does not uh, countenance uh, abuse. <laughs> this is not countenance uh, something like that. We're not talking about that. That's a whole other ball game. But this is in the general uh, run-of-the-mill uh, relationship stuff, which goes on in intimate relationship. It goes on with parents and children, children and parents, friends, family. Uh, it's it's always the same, and then nations and all that. People who are angry at us, people who hate us, they're doing it because they are suffering. They are suffering. Let us be clear about that. Even if they say they're not, they are suffering. Because people who are at ease, people who are happy, people who feel interconnected with life uh, do not want to do harm to other people. Right? They don't. So we know they are suffering. And uh, again, we, we have other ways of, of, of dealing with that. So these two. The third uh, mudita is, to, is joy in the joy of others. This means, it's really, this is the antidote, this is the opposite of, we might say, a jealousy. Right. This is a big one. And this is the, really the opposite of control manipulation, right? Where we want the other person, people we're in relationship with, parents, children, uh, other peoples in the world, uh, you know, we really want them to be happy the way we want them to be happy, right? And we are disturbed. We pull back our love when we perceive that their uh, means to happiness is different than ours. Now again, I'm not talking about killing and destroying, please, so we understand that. Uh, but we're talking generally. It's like a parent who, uh, who can't accept that their child, you know, and some of you may be parents and some of you may be children who had parents who, who uh, when you pursued your path in life, which may have been different than theirs, uh, they were not happy. They did not wish you well, right? Because their so-called love had the element of what? Control. They wanted their child to be happy uh, the way they wanted them to be happy. Again, in Buddhism, that is not true love. In true love, I let go of my own agenda for the other person, and all I want them to be is what? 
happy. Right. Now, that's extended also to uh, other situations. Uh, you know, we are often jealous of people uh, who are what? I don't know, people are jealous of people who look better than we do, right? We are jealous of people who uh, uh, make more money than us. We are jealous of people who get the advancement and we don't, right? There are lots of things, lots of pettiness uh, that we are involved in life and we might call that's because we are jealous of other people. When we hear good news about somebody, we don't go, how wonderful. Right, we think what? Why not me? You know, why not me? Can you see that's, that's that egocentric view? That is not true love. True love, when it relates to the world, is uh, how wonderful. You know. <laughs> there is in the uh, mind trainings, uh, passed down uh, in, the Buddhist, in one of the Buddhist traditions, a, an interesting phrase. Uh, it is, it is an, I, I say it uh, uh, carefully because it is so un-American. <laughs> the phrase is, give victory to others. Take loss upon oneself. <sighs> that is, again, that is this, uh, that is getting at this, capacity uh, of taking joy in the joy of others. Yeah, I don't need to win. I don't need to come in first. Yeah, let other people feel, you know, if they want to let other people feel that joy. Let other people get uh, recognition. You know, we're usually going, hey, how come they're not mentioning my name? Right? How come no one's uh, saying something good about me? How come there's only saying something good about them? How come I didn't get the award? Right? You know that mind state? Rather than going when we hear somebody else calling, how wonderful for them. Yeah, give victory to them. Yeah. Because I'm cultivating something else in this life. I'm cultivating a loving mind. I'm cultivating a happy mind. Uh, I don't need my ego stroked endlessly to be happy. I have other ways of finding happiness. Uh, so again, this uh, joy in the joy of others, uh, happiness in the success of others is, is very important. And you can begin to see that through the practice of loving kindness, through the practice of compassion, through the practice of joy and the joy of others, our minds are becoming softer. Can you feel it? I mean, our minds become softer. Our minds are more open and at ease. If you think about a lot of our dramas, our endless emotional dramas, they're all involved with the opposite. <laughs> You know, can you see it? All your our dramas would disappear, wouldn't they? Right? Because all our dramas are not about uh, offering uh, friendship, are not about compassion and understanding, are not about taking joy in the joy in others. They are the opposite. So you can see, uh, you know, these teachings are love are not just airy, fairy, uh, mushy, uh, kind of, uh, you know, stuffed animal kind of stuff. <laughs> but they're very uh, practical. And they relate uh, precisely to our desire uh, to be happy human beings ourselves, as well as our desire to have a, a loving world. You see, because uh, most of us want a loving world, uh, but we're waiting for other people to do it. We don't uh, see a, a world where people uh, take care of one another, a world where people are good to one another. It begins with me. You know, can I learn to generate that kind of mind? 
Because if I can't generate it, how can I expect anybody else to? Right? But we usually work it the other way. We want everybody else. You know, you change, then I'll change. Right? You be nice, then I'll be nice. Right? Isn't that how we do it? Rather than going, no, that's my job, to be nice. Not always to be concerned about how nice you are. It's my job to change. Give victory to others. It's a, it's a wonderful phrase. It's, it's tough <laughs> for some of us. But we understand it. Because we want them to be happy. And we know when they're happy, you know what? They'll, they'll be nicer to be around. So in a certain sense, the practice of loving kindness and compassion and joy in the joy in others uh, can be a selfish practice for us. In the sense we understand that if I am generating that kind of energy, that kind of openness to those around me, there's a good chance that they will begin to also. But that's hard for our egos because we don't like to give it away for free, right? We want payoff. We want immediate results. We are willing to take a risk with love. We're not willing to just put it out there. And even if we don't get it back immediately, right, we're willing to be patient. Right. We have to be patient with this world because it's not used to love, is it? No. It's used to anger and violence and aggression and self-centeredness and me, you know, me, me, me. So it's not used to love. In the beginning, it, uh, you know, may be seen as weakness or they may not trust it. So we have to be patient and understand that in the beginning it's about my own transformation, the transformation of uh, my own heart. And hopefully in time that will uh, begin to open uh, and others will begin to change too. Uh, the, uh, the last one uh, is, and we've sort of, again, have talked about it, Veda, uh, which is, uh, means uh, equanimity or equality. It means that with these three prior ones, again, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and the joy of others, uh, I'm willing to again give it with equality to all. It's a different kind of equality. We're used to kind of equality before the law, equality in social relations and things like that. So this is a different kind of equality. It is something that we extend to everyone. Not simply because it's our judgment whether they deserve it or not, whether they're worthy of it or not. We give it unstintingly. And the other kind of translation of that equality, which is equanimity, which means, again, it is not, uh, it's done with an even mind. It's not done uh, when, I, when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm feeling good. Right? Today I'm not feeling good, so stay away from me, you know. You know, I'm kind of tired and cranky, you know, don't, don't expect uh, any kind of compassion from me today. Right? People like that. You know, their own moods uh, uh, are the basis for how they act. And we give ourselves a lot of leeway, right? Uh, we, put our, we put our teachings on love on like a coat, and then at times we decide to take it off. Well, it's like that. It's something we put on and off, depending on how we're feeling or the situation or whatever. So uh, equanimity means no. 
it's not like a coat that I put on and off depending on how I'm feeling. It is something that I generate no matter how I'm feeling. We give ourselves a lot of uh, leeway for our bad moods, for our crankiness, for our short-temperedness, right? But uh, again, it's, if we're going to hold anybody to a high bar, it'd probably be good to hold ourselves. Most of us hold everybody else to a high bar. We're always very uh, understanding of ourselves. We need to reverse that. So again, uh, this equanimity, this equality, uh, is really uh, puts it all together. It tells us how to how to practice these constantly, continually, and to really uh, generate it uh, again, even when we don't feel like it. Uh, but in time, we will. Uh, it'll change our minds over time. We'll have a different kind of mind. The mind of love uh, is a wonderful mind. We know that, right? Because when we're around loving people, people who love us, or people who look at us with love, or people to act on us in a loving way, how do we feel? We feel good. We feel great. Do we, we like it, right? Does anybody here not like it? <laughs> you know? I mean, if somebody says, no, I like people to really be pissed at me, and I really, uh, you know, we consider that sick. No, we, 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 we like people to be kind to us and loving to us and accepting and compassionate, right? And, and to be happy for us uh, in our life. So it is important that, uh, again, it is considered there in, in the tradition, uh, there are, <laughs> they actually enumerate all the, all the positive effects that come from having uh, a, a loving mind. Uh, you'll definitely have a peaceful mind. You'll definitely have a happy mind. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, in, 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 in the benefit sections of the sutras, it says, uh, and people will like to be around you. Right? People will like to be around you. Sometimes we may, may ask ourselves, Am I someone that I would want to be friendly with if I'm not a kind, loving, open, accepting human being? So uh, through the practice of, of love in the way we're talking, uh, people will want to be around us. They'll feel good when they're around us. They'll be happy uh, when they're with us. So it's, uh, it's a good payoff uh, there. Let me, before we end, and just take, uh, because we have to, you know, today is a special day for us, uh, children. This is the first day of our children's program, uh, which I think is just wonderful. It's wonderful to see children and hear children this morning, and they will be joining us at quarter of, just for a few minutes. So in the, uh, what's called the Metta Sutra, Sutta, uh, purported to be the uh, teachings of the Buddha, uh, it goes like this. And this is what she or he contemplates. May everyone be happy and safe, and may all hearts be filled with joy. May all beings live in security and peace. Beings who are frail or strong, tall or short, big or small, invisible or visible, near or far away, already born or yet to be born. May all of them dwell in perfect tranquility. Let no one do harm to anyone. Let no, one, let no one put the life of anyone in danger. Let no one, out of anger or ill will, wish anyone any harm. Just as a mother loves and protects her only child at the risk of her own life, cultivate boundless love to offer to all living beings in the entire cosmos. Let our boundless love pervade the whole universe above, below, and across. Our love will know no obstacles. Our heart will be absolutely free from hatred and enmity. Whether standing or walking, sitting or lying, as long as we are awake, we should maintain this mindfulness of love in our own heart. This is the noblest way of living. Uh, so that is from uh, what's called the discourse, the Buddhist discourse on love. Uh, 
Any any questions? Uh, yeah. But just as you were reading that, you had said earlier that there was really no word for love in Buddhism. A Pali, I guess, it would be the language. Mm -hmm. So, but I heard love in that. That's a translation. It's actually called the Metta Sutra. Metta. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, loving Metta is often translated as loving kindness. Uh, so I meant. About the closest thing that comes to that. Yeah, again, I, but I don't like to use it too much because, again, it has, in our culture, it is, romantic. it's romantic as well as it's, uh, you know, again, we love our cars, we, we, we love our Coke, we love our, right, we love our things. So it's a, it's a, it's different. <laughs> we love our dogs. Well, that's <laughs> any, any, uh, any questions about how to, uh, Really, what what this means, and whether it can be practiced, or whether uh, it's a, just a bunch of gobbledygook that we talk about on Sundays. But uh, when we leave here, we just go back doing it the way we've always done it at home, at work, in our relationships. Or is this something that everybody sees they have the potential uh, to do? If not, please ask a question. I mean, don't be shy. Yes. Could you speak a little bit about? Um, when you're talking about anger, so um, not so much on, on your own behalf, but on someone else's behalf. So it seems to me that it combines, you know, you might feel compassionate and loving kindness towards one person and be upset because somebody else is treating them badly or unfairly. So how do you put the elements together well, does everybody hear that? So the question is, uh, well, it's more about, I mean, isn't anger sort of justified at some point, especially when you see someone or somebody is treating somebody else uh, not the way we'd like them to treat them, right? Yeah. So again, our, our usual response is what you said, anger, right? And so often we act from anger in that situation rather than from love. Now, what would love mean? Uh, and again, people <laughs> would say to me, you know, do I have to love this person? No, you don't have to love that person. A lot of people, you can't, again, it's that love like an emotion. We don't, you know, we, we don't love everybody, do we? A lot of people really, uh, a lot of, there are a lot of jerks out there. Uh, but again, uh, we can be understanding, right? Again, uh, those of us who are parents, uh, we may have experience uh, that our children are acting like complete jerks. And yet we never stop uh, loving them in the way we're talking, right? And again, even if we have to act, right? Act. And many times we have to act with our children uh, to, to, to limit their behaviors. <laughs> Uh, we don't have to act from anger. You see, we think we have to act from anger. That's what mobilizes us, right? But we can act from understanding, and we can act from compassion, and we can act in a way that, that is diminishing suffering. Right? We see the situation as a, a situation of suffering, and that person who's acting poorly to that other person is suffering. They're not happy, are they? Now again, it doesn't mean we, we give them carte blanche to do whatever we, what they want. See, it's not saying that. It's saying that the, the mind that we're, that we're coming forth is not the mind of hatred, not the mind of anger, uh, not the mind of wanting to do harm to. Because that won't end anything. Because that person who's, who's acting that way has probably had in their life harm done to them. And you see where that got it. They're the product of that. So if we, if we just continue, we're just perpetuating it, aren't we? So we want to generate another kind of mind. And again, the action may look the same, right? But it's coming from a very different place, which, which, which offers many more possibilities uh, than the angry mind. The angry judgmental mind offers no possibilities, does it? Because the angry judgmental mind wants to harm at some level. Right? And it's a, it's a dangerous mind, isn't it? We all know that, don't we? When we act from anger, when we act from ill will, uh, it can be dangerous. We can end up creating things that we really 
in our best sense, really don't want, do we, to create. And we're often not really, you know, really dealing with whatever the issue is with that person or the situation in a very effective way, are we? We know that afterwards. Right? Because after the anger is passed and after the angry words have passed and the acting out is passed, we still have to what? Reconcile. <laughs> right? We still have to reconcile. So why, why create more poison, which makes the reconciliation more difficult? Why don't we just get right to it?